we get to the main event, as it were, uh, I wanted to do some plugs here for Real Progressives and let you guys know what we've been up to this year and, and what we're doing here going forward, what we have going on as an organization. Um, you can go to realprogressives.org for just about anything to do with us. If you'd like to support our organization, our Patreon is there. Uh, also, tons of articles, including on inflation and topics like it, educational, media, etc. We have podcasts from the, the Macro and Cheese podcast uh, that our, our founder and president Steve Grumbine does and Faudel today's uh, uh, presenter happens to be a regular guest on on macro and cheese. Uh, we also have Jody Newell does the up and up which is a, a show speaking with activists from all over um, about political activism. We do MMT Mondays with our co-editor-in-chief Jabari Morris. That is a, um, a Monday show that goes into economics and, and, and modern monetary theory. Uh, and you can also catch my show, which is kind of current events, political commentary, uh, Sundays at 2 Eastern on Real Progress in Action. I also did want to make sure that everybody knows we do have two YouTube channels, uh, Real Progressives, which is where this eventually will be posted. Faudel's uh, talk today will be posted. We also have Real Progress in Action. Um, we're a 501c3 and a 501c4, so that's the distinction there. Uh, but make sure you're not missing any of our content on either of those YouTube channels. And I also wanted to plug, we're doing a, an end of the year fundraiser that is uh, very exciting. There's a generous donor matching contributions through the end of the year. Um, so hopefully someone with the organization can maybe post that uh, a link there in the chat to that end of year fundraiser. But if you are able to contribute, we very much appreciate it. We're engaged in all sorts of, of media, education, outreach, activism, um, all sorts of stuff. So uh, if you can contribute, we very much uh, appreciate that. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce today's special guest, a, a friend of, of Real Progressives. Dr. Fadal Kaboob is a professor of economics at Denison. He's also the president of the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. Um, and we are, are very fortunate to have him here today to discuss inflation. Fadal, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Luke. And thanks, everybody, for hosting this event. And thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be with uh, my Real Progressive uh, friends uh, on, on Real Progressive events. Uh, and I, again, I'd like to encourage you to share uh, RP resources with your friends and your network, uh, the podcast, the YouTube channels, the, the articles. Uh, and for those of you who can contribute to this fundraiser, by all means, uh, um, uh, join, uh, join this effort. Uh, and special thanks to uh, the special donor who's matching uh, the contributions until the end of the year. Thanks again. Uh, Luke, well, instead of doing a formal presentation, I decided I'm not going to have um, uh, slides or lengthy uh, seminar type presentations. I thought we should really save as much time as possible to answer people's questions. So I'll, I'll go ahead and start with kind of a framing uh, opening remarks to frame uh, the, the conversation about inflation. Uh, and then we'll take it from there. So maybe it shouldn't take more than, you know, 15 ish 20 minutes or so to, to open up the conversation. So um, COVID, the last couple of years have been very difficult for, for all of us, but in terms of the economic uh, impact, the, the main concern today is inflation. And it's a concern for all of us, not just for people who oppose things like a Green New Deal or climate action or things like that. Um, so a couple of things to understand about inflation. We'll start with, with very basic so that we're not kind of uh, talking in, uh, in, a, in a vacuum. Inflation is measured in the U.S. by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the BLS, on a monthly basis. But we usually, when we talk about inflation, it's really the annual change from year to year. So what does the BLS do? The BLS looks at the average American family. They look at what we consume. They don't take the richest family or the poorest family. They don't take like the most luxurious items, basic things that the average family consumes, groceries, uh, transportation, housing, all of these things. And we put a price tag on every single item. And it's a massive effort that the BLS does, actually. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. And then, of course, they don't consider the price of, you know, uh, your, uh, you know, bubble gums in the, in the same way they consider the price of ma major food items. So they wait 
these items according to their importance to the family. So it's a very reasonable estimate. And when they construct this uh, index, they essentially calculate the average price level for that month. And then when they observe the price level increasing month to month, we call that inflation. When it decreases month to month or year to year, we call that deflation. So the inflation numbers that you've seen last month, for example, the 6% is that 6% increase in the, um, uh, in the index uh, from one period to the next. So is inflation really high? Yes. Was it really low prior to the pandemic? The BLS numbers will tell you, yes, inflation was less than 2%, 1.5%. But the average person, will knew, when you ask them how they feel about the price level, the cost of living, everybody will tell you, I'm feeling way more inflation than the 1.5% the media is talking about. And this is why, because when it comes to the items that have been inflating for the last several decades in the US, pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, it's four things. It's cost of energy and transportation in the US, real estate, housing, um, energy and transportation, uh, and uh, healthcare. These are the four drivers of inflation, health, real estate, energy, transportation, and education. And the MMT approach to inflation has been you know, on like a broken record for several years pre-pandemic saying, these are the items that we need to tackle. And what is the source of inflation? It's two things in each one of those industries and, and beyond. It's always about the availability of productive capacity. In other words, do we have enough productive capacity to deliver affordable housing? Do we have enough productive capacity to deliver affordable healthcare? And then when we have shortage of productive capacity, prices go up. That's one component. The second component of prices going up is actually key players in the economy who have abusive market power, who can raise prices simply because they can. And that has to do with corporate power. That type of inflation can't go away unless we tax and regulate that market power out of existence, unless we make those markets more competitive, more democratic. And that becomes a question for lawmakers, regulators, antitrust laws, and investment in productive capacity in the public sector to complement what the private sector is unable or unwilling to do. So those are kind of the, 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 the foundations of what we've been saying on the inflation front for a number of years now. That's why we talk about increasing investment in productive capacity in the energy sector, especially renewable energy. So we don't have you know, more of the climate crisis. And so we have more uh, affordable energy at the, at the local level in the US. Number two, we've been talking about the Medicare for all system that will lower the cost, increase accessibility to health services. Uh, and weaken the abusive market power of key players in the system, health insurance companies, and, and so on. Uh, that's number two. Number three, we've been talking about investing in education, uh, not only K through 12, not only pre, uh, pre-K education uh, as public education, but also community colleges and technical training so that the cost of education is not a burden on families. That, and it becomes part of our public education system for public schools and, and universities and, and technical training uh, institutes. Uh, that's how you increase the productive capacity. You democratize those entities and you tame the inflation pressure points. So pretty much everything we've been including in the Green New Deal package has been to target the sources of inflation And this becomes very counterintuitive to the average person who's lived outside the MMT space or engaged with this. And and now I'll take you to the mainstream narrative, which is the dominant narrative pre-pandemic and, of course, in the last uh, few months. Um, The mainstream narrative tells you that if we have more spending in the economy by the government, including the government spending on infrastructure or health or education, social services, or even worse, 
if the government is sending checks to help people during a pandemic or supporting the poor, supporting the unemployed, all of that means lots and lots of cash in the hands of people. They're going to go out on a shopping spree and they're going to drive up prices, right? That's the dominant narrative about the theory of inflation. Or if the Federal Reserve Bank makes money more accessible, cheaper, in terms of lending in the, in the financial sector and lending in, in the banking system, that will allow a much larger access to credit, more demand by consumers, and that will drive up prices. And that's why the standard approach, the mainstream approach to taming inflation is tighten monetary policy by raising interest rates and slowing down the increase in the money supply, and Tighten your belts on the fiscal side by reducing fiscal spending in order to slow down the increase in, in demand. Well, it turns out during the last uh, 12 years, between 2008 and 2000 and, um, and the pandemic in 2020, most central banks around the world, including the Fed, have been trying to avoid a cycle of deflation, a very dangerous cycle of deflation, which I can go back to, by targeting inflation at 2%. Our inflation has been below 2% for a decade. When I say we, it's we in the US, the ECB, Japan, the, the most of the industrialized world. So all the mainstream central bank policy makers have been targeting inflation at 2%. And they used every trick in the textbook to reach that inflation of 2% by following easy monetary policies, quantitative easing and everything you've heard about in the last 10 years. And they've all failed miserably. They couldn't reach the 2% infl inflation target, even though they tried to inflate the system. They thought they knew how to drive inflation higher. And eventually they all admitted, we have no reliable theory of inflation, which means we don't actually know what causes inflation. And my argument and the MMT argument is the following. The actual sources of inflation, which we've talked about, real estate, housing, uh, pandemic supply chain shortages, all of these things are way outside the jurisdiction of the central bank. There is nothing the ECB can do to unclog ports in China or in the US or other places. There's nothing the Federal Reserve Bank in the US can do to change global oil prices that are controlled by OPEC and other key players. There is nothing the Fed can do to change the pricing power of the five largest global mega corporations who control the global food supply. There's no connection. Now, who can tame the abusive market power of the global food suppliers? Who can tame the market power of the logistics companies that control shipping costs and have taken advantage of the panic around the global supply chain to cash in as much as they can in the last few years? It's not the Fed. It's not the ECB. It's not the Bank of Japan. It's the U.S. Congress that has the regulatory capacity, has the spending capacity. And these are the two things that MMT have been talking about. Spend in order to increase your physical productive capacity, your supply of skills, your logistical capabilities, and then tax and regulate abusers in the system, whether it's logistics, whether it's pharmaceuticals, whether it's transportation, whatever it is, in order to tame their pricing behavior. So there's nothing central banks can do now to tame the effects of COVID. Why? Because Central banks are not ministries of health. They don't have vaccines. They don't have masking mandates. They don't have anything that will help us globally to uh, slow down the spread of the virus and most importantly, slow down the potential mutations that will lead to new variants and new waves of COVID that will ripple through the global system with more disruptions. Because that's ultimately the underlying cause of the most recent disruptions and new sources of inflation that have emerged. So I talked about the pre-COVID inflation sources in the US, those are mostly corporate power. But with the pandemic, more disruptions rippled through the entire system and did two things. Number one, created actual shortages and delays. Number two, it gave a justification for abusive price setters and new abusive price setters that joined in 
to actually take advantage of the panic of the whole media frenzy about inflation and say, well, prices are going up, there's shortages all over, and it costs more to do it, so I'm going to charge more. But many of them in the last few weeks have been saying it publicly, not to the mainstream media, but to their shareholders saying, you should celebrate our success the last few months because the pricing environment has been favorable, right? Or we've been able to improve prices, or we've been able to increase our margins. Translate that in plain English, it means we took advantage of the situation, we raised prices, and nobody could complain. We raise prices because we can. And then there's a third component that's related to the pandemic effects, which kind of feeds into the psychology of consumers and producers, which is further expectations of potential shortages. So if you're, if you're in the business of producing anything in the US and shipping across the country or across the world, you want to have all of your components ready to go including the packaging. So if you know that there's global disruptions and that your inputs may be delayed and that your packaging may be delayed, then what you're going to do is you're going to place an order for three times the amount you normally need. And everybody does the same. So now your suppliers are not only trying to handle a global pandemic, but they're trying to handle three times the demand that they would normally need because everybody's panicking about not having enough to keep their company going. So none of that psychological feedback is going to disappear unless we transition to a system where we know we have COVID under control. We're not going to have more disruptions. So people go back to ordering the normal volumes that they would normally need. So that's very important. And again, that has nothing to do with what central banks can do. It's completely in the hands of your prime ministers, your presidents, your parliaments, your senates, your congress, depending on which country you are. It's the fiscal authority that has this, uh, the capacity to tame the actual sources of the pandemic disruptions and to tame the actual sources of abusive market power. And you do that by spending more, not by spending less. This is really the counterintuitive thing that most people are, are not able to handle. If you spend, let's say, I'm, I'm just going to make up a, a number here. If you spend, let's say, a trillion dollars on Build Back Better, you create millions of jobs, you pay people decent wages, they go out on, on a shopping spree. Like, it's a free country, right? I, I, I get a decent job. I have an income. I'm going to buy a new car. I want to buy a house. I'm going to take my family to vacation. That's what we want. We want people to spend their money. The problem is that increase in spending by those workers that we've hired to build back better is going to ripple through the system. We're going to have more demand for cars, more demand for housing, more demand for health, more demand for entertainment. And if our economy has those two components that I talked about earlier, shortages in these key areas in health and transportation and housing, and if we have abusive market power in these markets, then the one trillion that we spent on Build Back Better is going to actually feed the inflation machine. But if we spend two or three trillion on Build Back Better and we tax and regulate abusive market power in the inflation pressure points where we know this market power exists, then spending more creates more jobs, builds more productive capacity in areas where we have shortages, such as health or uh, uh, transportation, logistics, housing, affordable housing, by increasing the capacity, you tame the inflation pressure points. And by taxing and regulating abusive price setters in these markets, you eliminate the source of abusive inflation pressure. So it turns out spending more with the right targeting mechanism and taxing abusive market power, democratizing the economy, is actually not inflationary. That's your best inflation targeting policy. But doing none of that and simply increasing the interest rate, which is what the Fed is probably going to do, has no, no influence on the actual sources of inflation. It may actually feed the inflation even more because you're raising the cost of doing business on everybody. You may be driving people uh, out of economic activity and causing more unemployment, which is typically what central bankers do. 
They, they know it. They don't actually say it explicitly. Sometimes they say it behind closed doors. But essentially what they're doing, they're trying to slow down the economy, slow down the demand by throwing people under the bus, by making people unemployed so that they have no income to increase demand for housing, for transportation, for, and so on. That's what it is. And then we have fancy economists making up fancy models to justify it. But at the end of the day, that's what it is. And what scares me the most about the current situation, and I'll close with this maybe, and, and then we can open with, uh, with questions. I know we're trying to close this year on an optimistic note, <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking ahead to next year. What scares me the most, the, the scariest potential scenario, is the Fed doing what they said they would do, which is raising interest rates in an attempt to slow down the economy and throw people under the bus. But then the fiscal side of the economy, Congress, doesn't do enough with fiscal spending, and most importantly, with targeting market power, taxing and regulating market power. And we end up with a Congress the following year, we have midterm elections, and the hands of fiscally conservative legislators who refuse to do more on the fiscal side. So we have a dead end on the fiscal side and a monetary policy framework that says the only way out of this inflation is increasing interest rates. And potentially the pandemic, when these waves keep coming back with more global disruptions, it means we're not going to be able to tame inflation and we're going to have potentially more disruptions and unemployment. That's the worst case scenario. I hope I'm completely wrong in my forecast. I hope that the Fed doesn't go crazy with their interest rate raising policies. And I hope that the fiscal side really recognizes its capacity to deal with inflation and to deal with the potential disruptions that we have related to supply chains. And I hope that it's not just the US because this is a global problem. Because if we don't tackle COVID on a global scale, we can have disruptions on a global scale and it's gonna affect all of us. And I'll leave it at this and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you so much there, Fadl. That was a fantastic presentation. I just want to remind the audience, uh, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A section, uh, and we will uh, allow you to come on and ask Fadl your questions. Um, if you would prefer to have me read them, please just note that in the Q&A, and I'm happy to read your question for you. Um, I'm going to start with a, a quick question here, Fadl, and then we'll, we'll turn to the audience. Um, I'm just a little bit confused by some of the, it seems like there's a contradiction in the way that the mainstream is approaching this, where on one hand, there is an acknowledgement of the Fed saying we have no valid theory of inflation and, and seemingly you know, things moving in a direction of less fear mongering about public spending. And on the other hand, as soon as we saw this increase in prices, the immediate reflexive response from the media and from mainstream economists seems to be to, to treat it as a demand pull inflation. So it, it, that just seems like almost contradictory to me. I'm, I'm wondering if maybe you can speak to where we're at in the transition of, um, of views on that stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't see any transition of views. I, I see more of the contradictions and, and people feeling really um, out of options on, on the monetary policy side. Uh, notice that the, the Fed um, tried to hold off on changing their tone about inflation for as long as they could. And then eventually they had to accept the fact that inflation is going up and there's nothing that they can do about it other than the single tool that they have, which is raising interest rates. So they tried to, to use um, what, what some of us call open mouth operations, kind of talking people out of the fear of inflation. And of course, it doesn't work because the sources of inflation are way outside the, the psychology even uh, and way outside their jurisdiction. So, so that's what happens when the fiscal authority, when the, when the sovereign government that has the capacity to regulate, to spend, to tax, abdicates all of those responsibilities about taming inflation and gives it to an authority, the central bank, that has no tools and no jurisdiction to deal with it, right? Uh, that's, that's really the, the problem. So it, it's the work that real progressives and, and other groups are doing is so important in terms of public education and raising public awareness about who's actually responsible for doing this job for taming inflation. And it's actually not the central bank. 
It's the 535 people we elect in Washington. And if they don't know what they're doing, then they should leave the job to somebody else who can actually do the job. Um, of course, they claim, that many of them, obviously on the conservative side, they, they claim that the inflation is happening because they spend too much and they need to cut the spending, right? But they should listen to their corporate sponsors, their corporate donors, because they know that they've been really enjoying the last few months worth of uh, inflation panics and supply chain disruptions, not only to increase the cost of their products to cover the cost of the disruption, but take advantage and push higher. That's really the key. So we're not saying there's no disruption. There is disruption and there is an increased cost associated with it, but they took advantage of the opportunity to widen the margin, right? And, and that's really the, the problem that, that we have here. Um, Perfect. Um, I am having a little bit of trouble viewing the Q&A, so I'm gonna pass this over to Virginia here to start the questions with the audience. Great, and Andy and I will call on people. Um, the first question is from Ad Aditya. I apologize if I'm not uh, pronouncing your name correctly. You have to unmute yourself um, and then you can ask it. Hi, can you, everyone hear me? Yes. yes. All right, hi Fadel, hi um, RP. Thanks very much for this opportunity, Fadel. Let me just first say that um, I've loved all the material uh, I've seen both on Macro and Cheese and elsewhere. Um, so actually you kind of answered <laughs> some of my questions along the way. So I'm going to reframe it. I think I had uh, come under the impression from um, a lot of the MMT discussions and stuff that like supply chains was like a dominant um, basically uh, source of inflation now. And then um, historically, but it seemed like in your talk, you were, you really did say the demand pull uh, could be also is, is a major factor. So I guess my question is that, you know, first sort of a, a question of your analysis of now, you know, do you think that today in the current environment, there is any empirical evidence for um, demand pull inflation, you know, and of course, conceding that supply chain is, you know, the principal or the aggravating um, component of it. And, you know, and, and if that's the case, you know, I mean, is it, first of all, if you can disaggregate the two supply chain versus mm -hmm. demand pull, I mean, even from a policy standpoint, uh, those should be approached differently, I would think. Think. Sure. I mean, especially if essential workers and it's like staples and things like that are sort of, you're seeing like moderate 10% sorts of changes and things. I would think that's the kind of thing you may not want to <laughs> try to um, right. uh, necessarily approach. And I guess, I guess my really quick question, because this, again, this is reframed from a little bit of my understanding. When you talk about taxation, um, what can you maybe provide an example of how you would use taxation as a means to regulate abusive market power? Very good. Well, thank you for, for your questions. This is very important to clarify here. So on the, on the demand side versus the supply side, uh, clearly there's been a lot of disruption on the supply side. On the demand side, uh, there's been, uh, yes, a, a shift from services to, to uh, durables, and, and that's been because of the, the pandemic. Um, but it's not like we've, we're way out of control in terms of consumer spending going completely insane uh, in the last uh, few years, uh, in the last couple of years. So uh, I'm not going to deny that there isn't an increase in demand and it all happened at once in kind of pockets of uh, particular uh, products and pockets of times when we have reopenings and things like that. Um, but because of this stop and go type of disruption that we have on the demand side, on the, the supply side is not able to respond, um, not necessarily mm -hmm. because there isn't enough productive capacity for particular items, but sometimes because of the shipping, because of the delivery or because of the packaging. In many cases, the delivery is there, the, the products are there, but the packaging is not there, uh, including the shipping containers, many of them have been stuck in parts of Africa that have no capacity to ship back to China, for example. Um, wooden pallets for major shipping um, uh, logistics, massive shortages. And the, the key part that we have to recognize also on the supply side here, because it's, it's interacting with the demand too. Mm -hmm. On the supply side, when you have when you live in an environment where you know this is COVID related and the, there's, these are bursts of additional demand that you're not able to handle, you have two options. One is do nothing and just keep working at capacity as much as you can, add a second shift or something like that. 
Two is think forward and say, well, if this is going to be a persistent disruption or persistent increase in demand, then what I need to do is build more capacity, That's really invest good. in more equipment. And that costs millions of dollars for, for some businesses. The thing is, most key players, including uh, in logistics and shipping and manufacturing, are convinced that this is going to be temporary disruption. So there's no need to double productive capacity or triple productive capacity, because then you'll face a situation of having excess capacity and, and you go out of business, right? So what you want to do is take advantage of the current situation, try the double shift and the triple shifts, try to um, you know, be uh, proactive in terms of uh, your purchases so that you're purchasing more supplies than when, what you normally uh, need, and then take advantage of the favorable pricing environment that you have. And that's what we've seen on, uh, on, on the logistics side. For example, when it comes to shipping from China to, uh, to the US, uh, a standard shipping container would have been $2,000 a piece pre-pandemic. Now during the pandemic, going to $20,000, $25,000 a piece. Now you would think that the, the additional cost has been um, kind of transferred on to um, uh, kind of the benefits from the additional pricing power has been evenly distributed to everybody in the logistics system. It's not, you know, that's why we have 80,000 truck drivers missing uh, in, in the logistics system because they're the Uber drivers for the logistics system. Even though the container is now, the, the shippers are getting charged $25,000, the truck drivers are getting nothing out of it other than getting stuck at the port for eight hours. And of course, if you're, if you're an Uber driver and you're sitting at the port for eight hours, not actually getting paid for the load, then what are you going to do? You're going to quit. And you're going to refuse working at the ports. So this is where taxing and regulating abusive market power and building additional productive capacity can unclog your supply chains and can evenly distribute um, uh, the, the, the margins that the industry is, is making. Now, the Biden administration has done half of that or is, is attempting to do half of that, which is the $17.5 billion that the Biden administration has dedicated to ports and logistics to unclog the, the backlog of, uh, of, of the shipping industry. But it completely ignored the abuse of market power. It completely ignored why the truck drivers are not willing to continue in this Uberization system and this abuse system. And, and, and that's why it's a half measure. It's not really a, a complete uh, measure. So when I say taxing, it's setting standards, uh, taxing abusive pricing behavior, regulating it out of existence is actually better than taxing. I, I use taxing frequently to, as, a, as a disincentive, not because the government needs to generate revenues or anything like that. I hope it answers your, your question. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it was very much in the framework, especially in sort of MMT 101, when they talk about using taxation, one of its principal tools is to regulate inflation. It sounds like taxation could be a tool for, well, I guess for reducing demand, but also, as you were saying, maybe uh, for um, regulating market power. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. So I have another question here. This was actually typed in from uh, Steve Grumbine, our founder and CEO. He is typing this from Mike Hall, who is in London and says he's time zone challenged, but was hoping you could address a topic for him. Sure. Um, th this is 1 a.m. Dublin, London time over here, but no doubt will be recorded and available shortly. I do hope FADO will include Warren Mosler's price level origin and monopoly currency issuer story alongside the relative price setter story to complete the MMT theory of inflation defined as a continuous phenomenon, not mere price increase. The latter a known fact, the former unmeasurable estimate. It's not necessarily a question, but if yeah. you could just address that topic there. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if I wanted to include that, it will, it will take us a, a whole other, you know, 20, 30 minutes for me to explain it. It's, I would actually highly recommend everybody uh, to listen to Warren's own, uh, well, read Warren's own paper on this, which is fantastic. And I think he, he did uh, a couple of podcasts, one with 
uh, Steve, I believe, uh, recently, another one on the MMT podcast explaining kind of the narrative that he builds in, in his paper. Uh, completely consistent, complementary to this. My focus in this uh, discussion today, and especially in the, in the current context of everybody worrying about the, the COVID-related inflation disruption, I wanted to emphasize more the, um, uh, what the Fed is doing, what the, what the government is doing, and, and shine a light on the abusive market power that should have been dealt with pre-pandemic, this is even more important to deal with uh, right now moving forward. So I, I wouldn't uh, say it's consistent, inconsistent. It's completely consistent with, with Warren's approach. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I will pass it back to Virginia to bring someone else on here for another question. Okay. Uh, we have Alfonso, which is, and Alfonso, if you can see, maybe you could also read Fat, Fata's um question as well. Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Um, yes. Hi, everybody. I wanted to see if Fadel can uh, comment on Turkey's Lira um, developments as of lately. Uh, the president cut interest rates contrary to what mainstream economics would prescribe for developing countries, and that affected the exchange rate and uh, Turkey has a big trade deficit, so sure. that affected prices. Uh, but uh, if you can talk a little bit about uh, interest rates uh, for developing countries, how right now everybody thinks, yeah. you know, inflation, you have to increase them, or vice versa. Yeah, very good question. Thank you. Well, uh, Turkey or the case of emerging countries, developing countries in, in general, uh, uh, is is a classic case of mainstream economists thinking that you know one single policy instrument can fix all of your problems, uh, and the confusion about what Turkey is doing and some people labeling it MMT, which is uh, is not by the way, uh, has to do with uh, also a narrow understanding of what MMT is about. MMT didn't say lower interest rates and everything will be fine across the board. If anything, on the economic development side, on the emerging market side, we've always said that central bankers are completely useless when it comes to stabilizing the exchange rate or taming inflation by raising or lowering interest rates. If anything, central bankers typically do what I described earlier, which is throwing people under the bus and keeping half the country in poverty in order to tame inflation. And they do that by raising interest rates, by stabilizing exchange rates, and by borrowing more externally. What Erdogan has, has done is to go against the, the mainstream approach, but without fixing any of the other problems. And that's why you have uh, what you have right now, which is a collapse of the currency and, and, a, and a complete panic in the system. So and very briefly, what the structural problems that um, the structural problems that Turkey have has has to do with increasingly in the last uh, couple of decades, more dependence on imports, including food, including energy and construction materials because, uh, because of the huge boom in construction and large scale projects that the, the government and, and the private sector has undertaken. Number, number two, you have, so these are the sources that apply pressure on your exchange rate, right? Because of, because of the excessive imports. Number two, in terms of abusive market power, uh, Turkey is, is a great example, especially in the real estate uh, sector, especially in the financial sector. Number three, you have massive consumer borrowing and private sector borrowing in foreign currencies, in dollars and in euros. So it's not necessarily the government that's borrowing massively to fuel its imports. It's the private sector that's been booming with access to credit in foreign currencies. Uh, and because of the current panic and the realization by the average person that the lira is getting weaker by the day, what most people have done is to take whatever liras they have and switch them to a dollar or euro bank account to prevent you know, further losses from, uh, from, uh, from the value of their, of their savings. Uh, so that keeps the panic uh, going. So raising interest rates today in Turkey 
will not fix it either. <laughs> so the, the problems are beyond raising or lowering the interest rates. So in short, um, what, what Turkey has been doing has nothing to do with the MMT um, uh, insights or, or analysis that we would uh, recommend. Um, and, and Turkey is, is stuck in a, in a deep structural uh, problem, in addition to political issues, regional geopolitical issues that kind of amplify these, uh, these problems. I hope it, at least in very brief ways, answers uh, your question. Thank you. So uh, we have another question here from another friend of Real Progressives, Jeff Ginter. Jeff, if you would like to unmute, unmute and ask your question. Yeah. Hey, how you doing, Fidel? It's nice to Good, see how you. How are you? Good Excellent. You. What a day. What a day. What a day. Must go to bed soon. Um, so I was I was always kind of curious because, you know, I've been reading about inflation for a long time. And you were mentioning you know, the four main drivers of inflation, housing, energy, health care and education. Uh, whereas the other sectors of the economy, all these health of these um, uh, consumer products coming down and down and down. And my understanding is that it's really the inflation of those four sectors that have been keeping us barely breathing at slightly below 2% inflation uh, while the cost of everything else was coming down. So my question is, if we actually did what we should do, you know, morally, if, if no other reason, uh, tame the inflation uh, issues of those four sectors, would we then be uh, like Japan fighting deflation? You know, because if we actually dealt with those four sectors, everything else is already coming down. Would we be in a deflation or in a, a deflationary spiral? And if so, how would we deal with that? Very good question. So, um, uh, again, the, the, the levers of the economy are, are multiple. So taming the sources of inflation in those four sectors will ripple through the system in different ways. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when we have the, uh, the other components of inflation that have been deflating, all the cheap stuff yeah. that we import from all over the world with you know, uh, abused labor globally, yep. uh, that that is also part of the problem. It's not like those sectors deflating is a good thing for everybody. Exactly. Right? Yeah. But then when we deal with those four sectors, when we increase um, productive capacity investments in domestic renewable energy capacity, and especially when we increase the manufacturing uh, and installation and maintenance, we're creating millions of jobs that give consumers in the U.S. higher purchasing power more economic stability, more consumer confidence. So we'll have more resilience, not just on the environmental stuff, but on the economic front. Mm -hmm. So that will drive demand in other sectors of the economy in a positive way. Yeah. Um, number two, when we invest in, in education and technical training, which is extremely important for the future of this country and of the planet in general. The unknown future. <laughs> exactly. When we invest in education and technical skills, we're producing people who will be staffing the new industries, the industries of the future, which we know are more technical, more automated, and require higher levels of skills and education and, and technical preparation. But those occupations also pay better. So yeah. increasing the purchasing power, the resilience. So all of these components will ripple through the system in a, in a positive way, in the sense by taming abusive market power, increasing accessibility to services, education and health and so on, improves the uh, uh, economic um, uh, resilience of, of those consumers mm -hmm. and ripples through the system in a, in a positive way. So I'm not concerned about the potential deflation scenario that we face if we do the right thing today sure. and we okay. tame the sources of inflation. Uh, we, we know how to handle that type of uh, uh, potential adjustment eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank you. So we have a question here from Christina that I'm going to read um, for her. She says, on taming pricing behavior... Oh, I'm sorry, my screen just scrolled. Give me just a second. I'm sorry. Here we go. On taming pricing behavior and manufactured inflation by monopolies and giants of industries, who is the regulatory and investigative body? Does this belong to the hands of Congress or executive with help of the justice system or both? Very good. 
this is primarily in the hands of Congress. It can certainly be done by the White House and, uh, and, um, and its legal staff, obviously, but it's really uh, on an operational basis, on a permanent basis, this is in the hands of, um, uh, of Congress. Uh, so we're talking about uh, regulating telecoms. We already have agencies who do that. Regulating pharmaceuticals, we have agencies who do that. Regulating banking, we have uh, committees and, and agencies who do that. Do they do it effectively? Absolutely not. Uh, do they dare to cross the line? <laughs> Absolutely not. And now we're talking about democracy and, and politics because the, the Congress uh, people and senators who staff those committees and have the capacity to call hearings uh, and to push for uh, regulatory adjustments that will actually tackle this market power they're brought to you by uh, like the NASCAR sponsorship, you know, jackets. So are they gonna bite the hands that feed them? Uh, mostly not, right? Based on what we have right now. Is that the best we can do? Absolutely not. You know, vote them out of office. This is what democracy is, is about. And we've been saying for, for years now, do we want the government of the people, by the people, for the people, which is what democracy is supposed to be? Or do we want a government of the super PACs, by the super PACs, for the super PACs, which is what we currently have? So shining a light on the sources of inflation and linking it to the political corruption that we have right now is going to be our only way out of the multiple crises that we're dealing with uh, today. Uh, and I, uh, there's no other way of putting it, right? Um, we know how to do these things. Uh, we've had PICORA investigations um, during the Great Depression that really kind of opened the door for the New Deal to actually take place. There wouldn't be a, a New Deal in the U.S. without the PICORA investigations, without going after the, the corruption uh, and abuse that we had in, in the system. And many of our friends in RP and, and beyond have been calling for a new PICORA investigation. You have to have a clean new deal before you have a green new deal. Uh, it, it's just not gonna happen. And, and we've seen what happened the last couple of years with all the push for Build Back Better and Green New Deal and climate infrastructure and social spending. It's going nowhere because the gatekeepers are doing what gatekeepers do. Very effectively so, aren't they? Um, uh, it, we have a question now from another Real Progressives volunteer, Kennedy Carter. Kennedy, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hi, Kennedy. If you're talking, Kennedy, we don't hear you. You got to unmute. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. So actually, well, but should I just ask my first question? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so my first question, um, I, I guess when you, uh, I, for students that are pursuing like more neoclassical economics grad programs, but they've also like consumed some of these MMT white papers and are thinking about using those credentials to advocate for change despite not having an education that highlights all of your work and the work of so many tears. Uh, I'm asking this for the people who are unable to travel to Barter, Kansas, but would like to work in the space. How do you think they should orient uh, looking into the future of this work? Uh, the sound was breaking a little bit, but I think uh, if I heard you correctly, you're asking about how do students who are pursuing uh, economics education in mainstream neoclassical programs, but have been reading and, and learning the MMT approach, how should they proceed in terms of uh, their, uh, their understanding. Uh, exactly. I, yeah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. <laughs> I'm trying to mince my words here <laughs> just to, to be careful with what I say. Um, uh, but no, more seriously, and, and really to be, to be honest, uh, it, it's a challenge because I, I've had many friends and former students who who feel like they're, they're trapped in between two paradigms as students. Uh, as a student, you have to learn the stuff, go through the material, 
write your papers, take your exams and pass. So by all means, do that. <laughs> um, and it's not so, um, so much uh, of a problem for undergrads and even master students. It really becomes a problem, a serious problem for PhD students. Because mm -hmm. when you write a PhD dissertation, uh, you have your, your committee members and your advisors will really uh, be a major influence in terms of what they will accept as acceptable PhD level work uh, and what they will not. And, and in many mainstream programs, if you bring heterodox ideas, whether it's Marxism or feminism or MMT or any, any of the you know, pluralistic approaches to, to economics, it's considered not economics. So it considers, it's considered not um, you know, n unacceptable for many mainstream programs. So that becomes a, a problem. But for many undergrad uh, students, um, you know, the, your faculty will be willing to engage in interesting conversations. They may, you know, ignore it or, or something like that. So it, it doesn't really affect you as much as writing a dissertation. And if you're going to write a dissertation in a mainstream program using mainstream methods and going through the motions, what are you going to do next, right? And once you get your PhD, you're going to go out in the real world, you're going to apply for jobs. Many PhDs end up in teaching jobs. Well, then it becomes who's going to hire you. You're going to be hired in mainstream programs. Those mainstream programs expect a certain kind of publications in order for you to get tenure as a, as a professor. So you're going to continue to publish in mainstream journals using mainstream methods. And you're, you're set for life. <laughs> you're going to be very unhappy if you're really interested in shifting your approach to something that's more consistent with Keynes or Marx or MMT or anything like that. So it, it's going to be a difficult career, to say the least. Or you're going to move away from the mainstream uh, sector and apply for jobs in um, more open, pluralistic, heterodox departments. And most of those at the PhD level, we can count them on one hand in the U.S., I think most people know those places um, uh, or teaching at undergrad institutions, uh, which is wonderful and rewinding, uh, rewarding. Uh, I teach at one of those at Denison University, um, but it comes with the disadvantage of the rest of your career research not having access to graduate students to build a research program to, you know, further grow your field of research, um, which is a, a slight disadvantage compared to the top mainstream programs where you have graduate students and grants and funding to really accelerate your research agenda on the empirical front, on the theoretical front. So uh, these are serious um, decisions that grad students have to make, and they have to make with as much advice from people who have been through the system uh, and can talk to them very honestly about what are the pros and cons of pursuing a mainstream PhD uh, versus a, a non-mainstream PhD. And I do that frequently and I encourage grad students who are kind of stuck in this uh, uh, spot trying to make a decision because it's a life-changing decision. It affects your career and uh, and your, you know, your track for, for the rest of your life. So it's not a decision to take lightly. But in terms of going into a mainstream program and trying to change it as a grad student, forget it, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you, you can have the nicest advisors, the nicest, but because in most cases, they're, they, they're really trapped in a completely different paradigm. It's very hard for, um, for that paradigm shift to happen in those three or four years when you're trying to write your dissertation. Uh, it's just not enough engagement. And it's too much responsibility for you as a, as a student to go in on a, on a mission to convince your you know, uh, advisors that they should think differently. Thank you so much. That's like, that's very, very helpful. And if, is it okay if I follow up on that to add Absolutely. some hope for any of the students that are sure. listening in because of what you just said, specifically separating the master's from a PhD program, do you think that that means for people that are in that um, master's program or in that mainstream program, instead of focusing on, you know, fighting and changing that 
and making that battle that's impossible that you described. Is there, do you see more of an opportunity because of people like Nathan, some of the stuff that's happening with group progressives and superstructure things that are opening up to more networking for people who sure. pay attention to this work? Is that where an opportunity for people who don't have that Bard or um, yeah. John Cooney degree to be able to still do that work? Yeah. And we've had, I mean, just in my uh, two decades worth of uh, being in this uh, profession from grad school to, to today, we've had waves of student protests in, uh, in mainstream programs at Harvard, at Cambridge and other places, writing letters and uh, in, in France, getting even the Ministry of Higher Education to investigate the status of economics education. The Queen of England asked, you know, the economist to figure out how did you miss this? What's wrong with, with the economics education? So we've had moments of outbursts of rebellion from students and, and young professors and so on. But then we go back to teaching the textbook and, and doing uh, more of the same. So I'm not saying it's it's impossible. I'm hoping that one of these ad- outbursts will be the right one to to push for this paradigm shift. But it but it it takes much more than that, and the responsibility shouldn't be on on students simply rebelling and and hoping for the best. So next we have uh, Rebecca Rice. Rebecca, if you want to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Rebecca. Okay, got it. Sorry. <laughs> the prompt. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right. It's kind of a half comment, half question, because um, I've done, well, I'll start with a phrase that I heard, and I forgot who said it or who wrote it, but, well, Lucy paraphrased. Basically, they described saying that monetary, using monetary policy as opposed to fiscal is kind of like using a hammer, or, or I would say a machete, as when a scalpel is actually what's needed, right? And I've been thinking about it a lot because I've worked uh, grocery retail for about 21 years now. And this is, you know, we've seen shortages and things before, but this is a, but because of the pandemic, this is a very novel situation. And uh, what would you, would you say that that's an accurate uh, statement now, or is it, or is it corrected or uncorrected more or less? I mean, do, I mean, we, obviously yeah. fiscal policy will work the best in my opinion, but do you think that monetary policy is helping or hurting or is it just not enough? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there, there are a couple of metaphors that people use about monetary and fiscal policy, but I, I, I get what you're, you're saying. I'm kind of, um, I, I don't want people to walk away from this conversation thinking that the Fed is completely useless, <laughs> that there's nothing oh, no. they can do other than interest rates. As a matter of fact, the most effective tools they have are kind of the hidden tools that go beyond the manipulating the interest rate and the famous committee that sets the interest rate every six weeks and all that. Uh, to me, from an MMT perspective, that's probably the weakest, least effective committee. Uh, but the right. Fed has the capacity to regulate uh, the financial system, has the capacity to um, set more um, uh, focused um, standards for access to credit, right? So um, there's this idea that uh, MMTers often say, which is all spending can potentially be inflationary, we're not denying this. It's just most of the focus is on government spending, especially when government spending is on social services or on climate action or things like that. But we're forgetting that the private sector, especially the banking system, is pumping access to credit in areas of the economy that happen to have the most abusive power, the mm-hmm. most speculative power. So that access to finance that they have can be tamed and regulated by the Fed. And that's the part that the Fed doesn't do effectively, right? So it's not the committee that sets the interest rate. It's the other uh, part of the Fed. It's the other responsibility that the Fed has, which is to regulate access to credit and regulate banks. Uh, And when I say the Fed, it's the Fed, the SEC, the control of the currency, all the federal agencies that regulate the financial system, not just um, uh, commercial banks, but also the shadow banking uh, system. Um, So that aspect of regulating finance 
is extremely important to address inequality, to address inflation, uh, to, to address abusive market power across the system. So you're so absolutely you, right. Yeah. So would you say, I'm, I guess I'm trying to kind of clarify it. So would you say it's been effective, ineffective, or is it just mixed results given the other circumstances we're dealing with? Well, I think it has to do with the kind of the ideology that the Fed carries in its policy actions. The, the dominant ideology that the Fed has carried is uh, less regulation of the financial system is better. And this dates back to the years of um, um, uh, Volcker and, and especially Alan wow. Greenspan and, and beyond. And that mm. continued. So there is no paradigm shift in the Fed is saying, oh, we need to regulate mm. Wall Street more, right? It didn't really happen. And the focus was shifted exclusively to managing the interest rate. Like that's the only thing that will fix the economy. And that's where the phrase comes, um, the phrase that you were referring to, which is to, to the Fed, you know, the only tool you have is, is a hammer and any problem that pops up looks like a nail. So you yeah. just hammer it, right? When sometimes the problem is not a nail and it doesn't need to be hammered, <laughs> it needs Correct. a different approach, right? And the Fed has other tools in its toolbox, regulatory tools, but ideologically, the Fed has been very lenient on the regulatory side because they believe the private sector does what's best for the system. And that goes beyond the Fed. This is the Fed, ECB. This is the, the Basel Committee, which is in Switzerland that kind of oversees. It's kind of a private club for financial institutions. And over the years, they started inviting central bankers to join them in their private club to decide what's best for the industry and then send the central bankers back home to do what's best for the industry. And they meet regularly and take pictures and post them and tell us that they had fun. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. This, uh, the second part of it, it's, it's kind of tangential to it, but it, again, as someone that's been in this industry a while, I can tell you and anybody that's seen these shortages and freaking out, they're doing it. it what, the reopening was basically bass backwards, and I'm really trying to be polite here. Um, but what they should have done instead of opening restaurants and storefronts first, which is obviously to try and get people employed, it was short-sighted because when you look back at through, through, down throughout the chain, you got processing plants and factories and things that shut down. They, they didn't need to harvest trees. They didn't need to, you're, they were killing animals because they didn't think they were going to get them to market and process soon enough. So what they should have done was go way back to the beginning, get that ball rolling first, get, get the cow, get the cows processed, get the trees uh, chopped down, preferably not the hay, you know, get them to the processing plants and the factory. So you have, once you have steady production going, then you, then you would be relatively safe to open up these storefronts and restaurants. You'd have a few hiccups, but you wouldn't be having these crises and you wouldn't be fueling this type of inflation to begin with. Uh, absolutely. This is and my opinion. <laughs> you're, you're correct in terms of getting to the beginning of the beginning, but I'll go one more step further, which is getting to the virus, getting to the global pandemic, which yes. started the whole disruption. And, and that's really what, what we're talking about here. Any other mm -hmm. measures that ignore the linkages in the supply chain and the real sources that cause the disruption and cause the, uh, the, the inflation uh, pressure points will be, will be ineffective, will be useless. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm seeing it in real, and I'm seeing it in real time. And, and, and they, they want us alive just long enough to work ourselves to death and fulfill the capitalist dream. So, yeah. Rebecca works, in, wrong. Rebecca works in, <laughs> in the food industry retail, so she sees it up close yeah. and personal. Yeah. Yes, Absolutely. I do. Anyway, so we, I won't take any more time. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rebecca. Um, we have a familiar character here to bring on for our next question, founder and CEO of Real Progressive, Steve Grumbine. Steve, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Yeah, so my son is going to be coming down from his bath, so I'm going to make the question very quick. <laughs> um, and Fadal, this is definitely a challenging one. I didn't go for the low-hanging MMT fruit. I wanted to go for the one that will stretch us all a little bit. I said one, one of the major complaints from outsiders is that MMT is a description, but a description that 
to fully optimize requires a functioning democracy. As corruption runs so rampantly through our government, by what measures do we feel we can impact these areas? The courts appear compromised. The halls of Congress are compromised. Law enforcement is compromised. What power do we have to exact a new PCORA investigation or to pass legislation, much less elect an MMT informed progressive? And what's not said there is when you see the rigging of elections or at least the appearance of rigging of elections. Is electoralism a meaningful pathway forward or will this require meaningful outside direct action? Very good question. So I'll, I'll pick on that last part, which is uh, meaningful outside intervention, I think uh, is the phrase you used, uh, Steve. Direct action. Direct action. <laughs> yes, so what do we mean by direct action? A revolution, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm down, man. No, okay. <laughs> no, no, I, no, I'm taking this very seriously uh, because yes. everything you said before that is is absolutely right. And we've been discussing it for, for a long time and we've we've brought it up earlier, which is when you have a corrupt political system brought to you by super PACs, what do you do? You know, you try to elect real progressives and you get destroyed during the campaign by super PACs. You know, we can get one or two progressives in. We can get a, a mini, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, mini squad <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in, in Congress. And then that's it. You, you can't really go beyond that with the, with the current system. And I think um, uh, I'm all for revolutions, but, but well-informed pitchforks <laughs> type of revolution. Because we've, we've seen revolutions fail all over the world, uh, including in my home country in, in Tunisia. Uh, people, you know, uh, getting uh, really fed up with the system, with the abuse, with the corruption, with the neglect, with the socioeconomic exclusion, and saying enough is enough. We're going to get rid of the establishment, get rid of the dictator, get rid of the abuse. And in a matter of days, you can overthrow a police state. You can overthrow dictatorship. It's, it's been done many, many times. That's not the difficult part. The difficult part is when you do that and you're transitioning to what we hope is a better system is do you have a paradigm shift in terms of how we govern the system? Not in terms of corruption and, uh, and, and abuse and, and, and justice and all that. You can have people with all the good intentions about justice, about fairness and all of that. But then they come in with a neoliberal economic model that does the same. Uh -huh. And they rely on the same elites in the corporate sector and donors to in the media to get their well-intentioned policy framework in place. And then we're back to square one with new faces. I, I would I, rather not go through that. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I would I rather work with the people who will drive that revolution and have them well-prepared with an actual bulletproof paradigm shift framework that says not only will we displace you and replace you, whether it's via elections or revolutions or whatever, but we actually know how to undo the hidden powers, the structural traps that are in the system. And we know how to put in place a prosperous, sustainable, uh, equitable system. I think if we, if we do that, even without a revolution, if we actually have the grassroots forces that are well-informed, well-prepared, and are ready to walk in and push back and call their bluff, we would have them you know, packing up and, and running to the hills before there's even a revolution. Uh, and if we have that, then you can have your PCOR investigations. Then you can have a cleansing of the system from, uh, from corruption and from, from abuse. Um, because... Because that's the scariest thing I think we have in our toolbox is the truth, is being able to call their bluff and, and undo the, the deep uh, power that, uh, that corporations have, that political elites have. Uh, and, and that deep power is kind of in our heads because it's really about understanding how the system works. They don't have soldiers controlling us every day 
although some people have, you know, concerns about social media <laughs> and, and all of that. But it's really a, a conceptual power. I mean, look at what's happening now. They got everybody scared about inflation to the point that they can raise prices and do whatever they can. And there's nothing you can do about it because most people believe it. We say, yeah, we're right. Um, it, it is inflation and uh, we, should, we should deal with it. We should throw some people under the bus uh, and allow corporations to raise prices to cover their costs and allow the same politicians to continue hijacking the system for their benefit and for their friends' benefits. And we'll vote for you again. That's the problem, right? If, if we don't undo that part, no matter how angry people are, how revolutionary they get, we're going to be back in the same trap with new faces. Fadal, this is I, the last piece to that that you that I want to just interject in, and, I, and then I'll move on and let someone else talk. But when I look at the things that are out there, like Wolfpack is pushing for like the Constitutional Convention. Little do they know that 50 years ago, the right wing was already preparing for this, which is why they have all the governorships, which is why they have literally taken the 10th Amendment and made it their precious. And, and we have very, very little to show for our efforts as lefties, because as Bill Mitchell very eloquently pointed out, we've been able to get distraction and splintered into a million forms of identity politics to the exclusion of the core Marxist principles that led us to solidarity, which is the working class versus capital. And because that has been so severely destroyed, our alienation from one another, ourselves, et cetera, has become so profound that I wonder if we would be able, this generation as it stands with everything we've been raised to believe and everything that we've ingested through school, church, television, you name it, if we as a society have the capacity to change, to be able to do that. Because like I said, everybody that's pushing for these things, you nailed it. They're already gearing towards another neoliberal perspective. They don't see a different future. They don't understand that something exists beyond neoliberalism. Yeah, um, I, I'm really, you know, you're, you're pushing my pessimism buttons now. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Happy New uh, Year, everybody. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to bring a positive twist to this. I'm but, such a bad know, guy. What can I say? <laughs> No, but but these are these are the the issues. We either face them or or we don't. I mean, we're we're fooling ourselves if we if we just keep saying that you know better world is uh, around the corner. <laughs> we don't do anything about it uh, on the education front, but also on the political action front. Um, I mean, it, it's been said many times before, and I am almost in in denial of this uh, idea, which is you really need a, a serious crisis. To, to change the system. And, you know, haven't we <laughs> been through enough crises <laughs> already? 2008 and, and COVID and, um, and, and climate crisis, uh, it's just how much will it take for, um, for, for real change to take place? I mean, look at what, what's been happening since the, the beginning of the Biden administration. You know, all the, you know, real progressive forces uh, that uh, conceded and, and said, we'll, we'll push Biden to the left. Um, you know, look at where we are uh, with barely any, you know, substantial action on, on climate, on infrastructure, not even on healthcare yet or any of the big issues. And we're one year in and we're already defeated and we have uh, King Joe Manchin running the show. Um, and, and, you know, God forbids whatever is going to happen in the next midterm elections, uh, it's, it's not looking good. <laughs> uh, so do we, do we keep compromising and, and getting back to where we are today? Or do we keep pushing on, on rallying the, the grassroots forces with, uh, with, with more powerful messaging uh, to uh, to create some real change, uh, because the, the the thought of having a divided Congress next year uh, is is just 
too much to bear in terms of all the challenges that we're facing and will continue to face. And having no action on the fiscal side and having the Fed doing what it thinks it will be doing, just raising interest rates and hoping for the best. Uh, and that's the United States of America. That's the, the country that's supposed to lead the world, right? Uh, we're not going to you know, wait for you know, other smaller, less influential countries to show the way uh, when, when real change should be happening here. And it's affordable. It's within reach. So who is standing in the way? The obstacles are mostly political. The obstacles are mostly ideological. It's not about the money. It's not about not having the technical capabilities or the research and development capabilities or the regulatory capabilities. We do have the regulatory capabilities. We do have a democracy on paper. It's just apply the damn thing. <laughs> apply the law and reinforce what the basic principles of the constitution were supposed to be, a government of the people, by the people, for the people. Uh, and, and that's definitely not what we have. Well, we I keep thinking beat a dead Congress, horse here. Sorry, oh, we ahead, keep Virginia. thinking Congress, we keep thinking Congress is going to do it. We need to look at the reasons they aren't. There's some some power somewhere yeah. else. Um, I want to remind everyone that, you know, we have 27 questions um, left and we have 10 more minutes with Fadl. Uh, so I want to apologize that we won't get to, to most questions. Um, I'd like to take it away from Congress for a minute. Nancy Hansen had a question, and I believe she is no longer here. So I'm going to read it. Um, and because you speak of you speak of hyperinflation and inflation, sometimes she she asks, "Is it correct the very few times we've actually experienced inflation in the U.S. has always followed a war? Uh, one exception: the oil gas industry um, created situation in the early '70s." And Rahul adds the um, adds the comment that it actually did follow a war. It followed the Arab-Israeli war. Right. Um, led OPEC to target countries with its oil embargo. But yeah, I would like you to speak to, to hyperinflation and inflation and what conditions they actually do occur in, the serious kind. Yeah. Very, very good question. I'll start with hyperinflation um, because uh, there's this myth that hyperinflation happens when the government goes crazy with spending and printing money and all of a sudden you have hyperinflation. Um, and, and here I'm going to quote our friends from, uh, from the Cato Institute, not the MMT crowd, not your Marxists. <laughs> These are the libertarians. They did actually a pretty good study looking at all the hyperinflation cases we know of in, in the history of, of the world. And every single one of them, they've identified what MMT says actually causes hyperinflation, which is a, a, typically a breakdown in the productive capacity, either because of a war destroying 40% of your productive capacity or an invasion or repara war reparations where uh, the winning country takes 40% of your productive capacity and demanding that you pay war reparations. Uh, or Mugabe, in, in the case of Zimbabwe, redistributing land to individuals who had no interest and no capacity to actually produce food. So you have 50% drop in food production. So no wonder food prices skyrocket. So typically that's one of the core components, a political breakdown, uh, a, a lack of productive capacity of some sort related to uh, a political event or war or uh, redistribution of resources of, of some sort. Um, typically what happens as soon as you have a shortage that drives up prices, all kinds of mechanisms kick in in order to create that, what feeds into the inflation spiral. Venezuela, for example, Venezuela was so vulnerable to a hyperinflation situation that the, the US embargo, all you have to do is just impose an embargo on the delivery of spare parts for the oil industry, which is the only source of economic revenue for, for the government. So you have no spare parts, you shut down your production essentially, and you have no revenue, right? So complete breakdown in the economic system. And Venezuela imports all of its food and now has to import uh, gasoline and all of its energy needs because you can't even pump oil in Venezuela, even though you have the largest reserve in, in the world. So that's how you have an economic breakdown. 
typically what happens as soon as you have that first outburst of inflation, of hyperinflation, you have cross-border trafficking with underground trafficking networks, sometimes with corruption, with police, with uh, military, with uh, border guards, building a, an underground cartel for, for food and medicine and gasoline delivery from neighboring countries, taking advantage of, uh, of the situation. And that becomes very hard to undo because now you're talking about armed cartels that are delivering milk and eggs and gasoline and medicine and have no interest in losing that market power. Um, and typically the, the cartels that go into the food delivery system and the gasoline delivery system during a hyperinflation uh, cycles are the same cartels that used to traffic people and traffic drugs and traffic all kinds of things. So they're, they're not playing with their market share when they, when they have it, especially if they bring in corrupt police and military and, and other entities with them. And that becomes the most difficult type of uh, thing to undo uh, in a country. And then you have governments panicking because there's complete breakdown. So their own officers and soldiers and police, um, uh, police officers can't afford food now with their government salary. And you do need them to protect government institutions, to, to deal with the riots that are happening. So what do you do? The first thing that governments do when they have hyperinflation is they raise the salary of their most critical security staff uh, so that they can afford food. So now you have no food, there's shortage of food, and all of a sudden you've given a bunch of officers an extra amount of cash to go out and outbid everybody else. What does that do to prices? It drives it even higher. What does that do to trafficking? It's even better business now. So these cycles always happen with a breakdown of productive capacity and abusive market power that either pre-exists or develops during the cycles of inflation. So how do you deal with hyperinflation? Is, is not by shutting down the government or switching to a foreign currency. You deal with it by dealing with the root causes, which is increase productive capacity, build resilience. That's why we emphasize in the global South, build resilience in the food sector and the energy sector because these are critical. You can't run an economy without, without them. Uh, and then tackle corruption, tackle abuse, tackle uh, trafficking, cross-border trafficking. And that's very challenging in, in developing countries. So you don't want to be trapped in a hyperinflation cycle because it becomes very difficult to undo logistically because of the, uh, the market power that develops outside your jurisdiction in very difficult situations. You want to avoid those situations by always building as much resilience as possible um, in, in the food sector and the renewable energy sector and keeping your economy resilient to these uh, external shocks. Uh, the, the question about uh, inflation, I think, so I dealt with hyperinflation. Um, in, inflation cycles in the U.S., I think it, it's been dealt with in the, um, uh, in the chat here uh, with Raul, I believe, uh, you know, explaining that the 1970s uh, inflation was, in the case of the U.S., was imported inflation. It didn't happen because of labor unions in the U.S. or too much government spending. It was a, a, a conflict in the Middle East. Uh, Arab countries decided they have a, an economic tool that they can use to apply pressure on the U.S., on Western countries, for siding too much with the Israeli side, and they used it. And all of a sudden, energy prices quadrupled, which means the price of every petrochemical that we use, whether for shipping and transportation, heating and cooling, or paint or hair product or whatever petrochemicals we, we use, all of those prices had to go up. So the inflation was completely external to the US system. It was a political conflict, and it was resolved by a political settlement to the problem with the, with a peace treaty uh, that essentially uh, tamed that initial source of uh, increase of uh, oil prices. Uh, and during the crisis, we've tried to deal with it in the US here the right way, actually, um, the right way, quote unquote, because the, that turned out to be an environmental disaster, which is by deregulating the natural gas industry. And, and starting the fracking frenzy that, that started in, at the time. But the idea was to find an energy substitute to the expensive energy we buy globally. And that was natural gas in, in the US. Um, so that actually began the, um, to, to relieve some of the inflation pressure uh, in the US. But the ultimate solution was 
fixing the political problem in the Middle East. And that tamed the source of inflation. So the MMT inflation, hyperinflation narrative has been bulletproof with every example you can think of. Uh, the dominant narrative, unfortunately, you still hear it on, on the airwaves. You still see it on TV and politicians saying government spending too much. That's what causes uh, inflation and hyperinflation, which is nonsense. There isn't a single case that where we can actually you know, have that narrow mainstream explanation of the government going crazy with spending and, and, and causing hyperinflations. Um, um, and that's really the narrative that we have to undo and we have to completely demystify. Fantastic. And just a quick plug, uh, the, the whole cost push uh, inflation concept was discussed by Faudel in a, a Macro and Cheese episode that dropped today in a discussion that or a talk he gave a few months ago. Um, we have one more. And if you guys could make this as, as quick as possible, we are running low on time here. But uh, a writer for Real Progressives, Thomas Ramirez, has a question uh, about financial asset inflation. Thomas, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hi, Thomas. If you're talking, Thomas, you're muted. Yeah. Oh, perhaps he's. Oh, sorry. Wait, I got it. I got it. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, good to see you again. Good to see you so, too. It's been so long. I forgot my question already. Oh, um, do you have anything to say about um, inflation of financial assets? Because I'm thinking if the, the past 10 years, if any attempt to put uh, money into any hands has worked, yeah. then that's that's where it went. And I'm thinking that before we see any kind of new deal, more likely we see a pop. And this is all just intuition. I don't look at the numbers. I assume that there would be a, a bursting of a private debt bubble first and, yeah. and, and maybe contagion to the real like productive commercial economy. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Financial uh, asset inflation is a huge part of uh, uh, the problem we have with inequality and abusive market power. And lots of it used to be illegal, you know, in this country up until recently. Stock buybacks uh, was deregulated, and that allows productive companies to take their profits and instead of investing in research and development and productive capacity and better pay and, and, and benefits for their workers. No, 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 they don't do that. They take it to drive their market, uh, uh, their stock uh, value higher by buying their own stock back and driving their uh, market value higher to the benefit of their shareholders and to the benefit of the top executives who have stock options and, and things like that. Uh, that should be... You know, it's legal today, but is that the right thing to do for an economy? Uh, it, it's, it's, it's irresponsible. It should be considered a fraud, right? This is, this is not how capitalism, in the pure sense of the term, was supposed to be. Capitalists were, were supposed to invest in capital. That's why we call it capitalism. We don't call it stock marxism marketism or whatever. Uh, so, so that's one component of it. So that has to do, again, with regulating the abusive market power that uh, corporations and financial institutions have. Uh, so I, fantastic. Yeah, that's all fantastic for closing me. question there. Oh, I'm sorry to cut you off there, Thomas. We are uh, a couple minutes past uh, the, the, the ending time here. So uh, I'm very sorry to those whose, whose questions we could not get to. There were tons of fantastic questions in, in the Q&A. Um, we appreciate everybody coming out today and especially appreciate Dr. Fadal Kaboob for taking the time. Um, and I just wanted to close by reminding you all that you can go to realprogressives.org to find out more about our organization, find all of our content. You can become, become a patron there. Um, and, and did want to plug that, that end of year fundraiser one more time. We have a generous donator that, uh, a donor rather that is matching donations through the end of the year. Um, it makes for a great gift. You guys, if, if you got progressive friends in your life, maybe, maybe ask for a donation or, or give them a donation and, and the gift of activism, uh, the gift that keeps on giving, so to say. So, um, want to thank everybody so much for coming out today and, uh, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you again. It's a pleasure. 